Thanks, Farhan, and thanks, Salim, uh, for inviting me on this and to be in London. And I, like, it looks like the weather is all right, so at least it's fine. Now, I, uh, this occasion happens to be the uh, 10th anniversary of this book that I produced in 2007, and now it is 17, so we have a decade on uh, that has gone. And in this book, where I discuss the influence of Arabic material onto the Renaissance, I focused on theoretical astronomy at that time, and I thought one topic at a time, let us only do what we can do within the confines of a book, ta ta ta. And then it turned out that, just like everything that you people know, that things accumulate after that. So what I'm going to do, actually, I'm sharing with, I will share with you uh, uh, new material, and then also to expand it a little bit outside theoretical astronomy. The purpose that I'm driving to at the very end is to show you that there is barely any discipline whatsoever that was not touched by a deep penetration from the Islamic civilization into the European, not only Renaissance, well into the 17th and practically into the 18th century. So, in that sense, I will make the point uh, similarly as we go here. Uh, and starting with the famous star names, in the, in the, uh, in here is, I don't know if the pointer will point to this one. You see the star names, every single star that is circled in red is a transparently Arabic name, and uh, people who know Arabic can immediately understand what is intended by the star. The passage of these star names came through Apianus and uh, the, the early part of the 16th century Apianus. It uh, tells us, and you can see on Apianus at Dubba in here, Al Ilya, Al Kor, and uh, uh, in here, Banat Naash, all of those came there. But it's not only that. What he did was something much, much deeper than that, and I will show you. He actually says in the text, of Apianus himself, when he comes to discuss the constellation Draco. What does he say in here? Look at it. He says, Ex draconis constellationi facet a sophi arabus quinque dromadores dupe duos lupus. He is saying, out of this Draco that is known from the Greek tradition, now Sophi makes a completely different constellation, and that constellation, in fact, is in Sophi. And, but Sufi quotes it not from the Almagest, as he usually does in his kitab, but he quotes it from the Arabs, meaning the Bedouin tradition, and he says, فَشَبَّهَتْ Arab وَهُوَ Here you have the five camels that only Apianus reawakens out of to see, and the two, the two, um, uh, the, the, meaning the two wolves that were buried in the Arabic tradition. So what this Renaissance man is doing, he's going beyond the Greek tradition that is transmitted through Sufi and digging out of the Bedouin Arabic tradition, the constellation that we have over there. Now, where is my water? I need some water. <laughs> When things are exciting, things like that, you begin to find them, you begin to wonder what was Apianus doing. Mm. Trying to actually recapture the Bedouin Arabic names is a cultural activity. It has very little to do with what Sufi was doing and what they were borrowing from, meaning to get just the names of the stars, it would have been sufficient to stop there. But why was he going all the way? And in fact, he is trying to replace an iconography there that is not a Greek iconography. Again, we all know the constellations reflect the gods of the Greeks and ta ta ta. But here, he is saying the Arabic tradition, the Bedouin tradition, says these stars, Al Awaid, are the four camels protecting the little calf in here from the a zeb and a zeb, those two wolves are going to attack. So you have a different dynamics of the whole constellations. A different Apianus was fascinated by that. He captures it. He does this for every constellation. He goes and chooses the Bedouin Arabic names and inserts them into the Latin text. And this is a fundamental text. Everybody read Apianus uh, the, from the 16th century onwards. We go on. He is not alone. I want to introduce this famous guy. 
This guy is the famous anatomist and the famous father of modern anatomy, none other than Vesalius. And what does Vesalius do for his doctorate in, uh, in medicine? This is again here his candidato in, the, uh, in medicine. And he ta takes the paraphrases of the ninth book of Frazi's Mansuri. So from the very beginning, his medical education, he tries to go and find in an Arabic text, of course in translation, he was not reading the Arabic, yet we don't know how much he was fascinated by the Arabic, how much he attempted to read, we don't know, but at least he chose for his dissertation to take the ninth book and to paraphrase it, and sure enough, the ninth book uh, became his dissertation, and when you compare it to the original Arabic, it makes perfect sense. This is the first page as you see it here. It begins by listing of the ninth book, listing all the diseases and the pains from top to bottom, and gives you the prescriptions for everyone, and it is rendered right there, as we can see it by Vesalius himself. As he progresses with his education, we hope, oh, oh you see, this thing is very nasty. Because you see, when the when the this is, this is all for all of us to learn. Uh, when this picture is uh, is high resolution, it takes time to load. <laughs> so, hopefully, now we are here you see, to do it and wait a second, and hopefully, it will load the next. There it is. In his Fabrica, which is the most famous work of Vesalius, at the very end of listing the book, I mean the bones of the body of the human um, uh, body, he makes the following statements. He tells us, I have endeavored simply to write the names of the bones, placing first those which I have known but through the text, then the Greeks named the Latin names for the best at that time, so that in order of names there will have some significance. Hebrew names, he says, will follow these, but also a few that are still in Arabic, almost all taken from the Hebrew translation of Avicenna, with the aid of a prominent physician and a close friend of mine, Lazarus the Jew of Frege, and with whom I, ac I am accustomed to work on Avicenna. So right next to Vesalius, there is Mr. Lazarus sitting right to him and teaching him Avicenna and guessing, because most of the times Lazarus was not very good in Arabic. We know from other studies he was not even very good in Hebrew. But <laughs> nevertheless, he was the intermediary. And now, for the first time, we have a father of modern anatomy confessing that he was getting his material, that he was studying Avicenna with this intermediary called Lazarus, and that's how the names of the bones come to be where they are in the te classic text of Vesalius. Goes on and he says the following thing, the famous Ibn Nafis, you remember all. This Ibn Nafis argument was that he needed to send the blood from the right ventricle to the left ventricle, because there is no passage whatsoever. That's what Ibn Nafis says. There is no passage right in here. Hence, his argument is to say it has to go through the lungs. Hence, the argument of the circulation. Ta -ta -ta. Remember what Ibn Nafis said. He said there is no way of this body of blood to come through the septum. It's a tough body. Vesalius comes to Padua in 1537 or so in his first edition of the Fabrica, which is in 1543, which is published in book six of it, chapter 11, he says, the blood soaks plentifully through the septum from the right ventricle into the left. He is repeating what Avicenna had said, repeating what Galen had said. But the same book, despite the influence of printing, for those who think that printing made all books look alike and produce these things, this is nonsense. In 1555, when the second edition of the same Fabrica comes, what does he say here? I still do not see how even the smallest quantity of blood can be transfused through the septum, through the substance of the septum from the right ventricle to the left. I say by 1555, he learned about Ibn Nafis. This is indisputable in the sense that in his own work, he progressed from 1543 and to 1555 to adopt finally the statement that was already made by Ibn Nafis in 1241. In other words, you see, I'm trying to do all of these things so that we can see the amount of subtlety 
in which this influence came in. It was not directly that you have a text and somebody sitting there translating it. Somebody was helping, somebody was reading, somebody was trying to figure out how to solve this problem and then finds the solution finally in the work of Ibn Nafis, adopts it and it becomes part of his work. Then we come to this, <laughs> and here since Siegfried is here, I love this. I was introduced to this character, by the way, about what, 10 years ago or so. Or we were in Napoli. And this beautiful Italian woman introduced me to this guy called Gian Battista della Porta. In 610, this, as you see in this edition, Gian Battista published a book that's called The Eris Transmutationibus, which is simply says of the, of the things that take place in the environment. And he published it in 1610, and then in 1614 he published it again. The only reason because between 610 and 1614 is that he had changed his title from John Battista della Porta uh, Neapolitani into Neoporta Lincei Neapolitani, for those who understand what does it mean to become a member of the Lincei, <laughs> Academia de Lincei, it means he stepped upward and now he introduces this into his book. But, in the title, when you flip through this book, and the first time I, I was encouraged to do it by Siegfried, who's sitting here, flip through the book, what do you see? A poem in Arabic praising the value of this book. Why was this 17th century Italian Renaissance man praising his book, selling his book? It's what we usually write on the dust cover of books. Why was he selling it with a poem in Arabic? written by a guy that took me two years to figure out, this Marki Dobili turns out to be Murkus Daibel from Mosul. He was the translator for the Vatican of all the correspondence that comes from the East. So now Della Porta goes and asks Murkus, who tells us what he is doing. He is a professor at the Jesuit school, you see, <laughs> Romano Gymnasio Lingue Arabia Professoris. He is teaching Arabic in the Jesuit school at the end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century, uh, De La Porta steals him and says, write me something in Arabic so that my book will, will add value on it. And why would Arabic add value in the 17th century? That's what we should be asking about it, but that's what he did. And by the way, this poetry is miserable poetry. <laughs> I can attest to it, <laughs> the fact that Murkus Daibel was no poet. I mean, he definitely not, a, but he tried his best and he helped his friend and that's, it goes in every one of the printing, 1610 and 1614 as you see, and obviously De La Porta liked it very much. In this same book of De La Porta, when he reaches chapter 9 of this book, look what he wanted to do. In chapter 9 he wanted to calculate the height of the atmosphere. Why was he wanted to do that? It will become clear to us in a little while. He needed to do that, and he says this problem was solved already by Al Hasno, means Al Hasan, yani Ibn, Ibn Al Haytham. And he quotes it that uh, as it comes, and this is the diagram that comes with it. It's not really all true because those people were not very smart. In fact, this called computation of the height of the atmosphere was first adopted by this. Andalusian Ibn Mu'adh, who died in 1075, who used exactly the same diagram, he is trying to find the height of O from Q. Why was he doing that? If you are a juridical person, and Ibn Mu'adh was, and he was asked, when I have to pray my Fajr prayer, when does Fajr begin? So he had to calculate how high is the atmosphere from which the first light of the sun gets refracted so that we'll, we have light in here, so that we can say now virtually that the dawn has started, hence you begin your prayer. So this was a question, a juridical question, for religious reasons the, uh, that uh, Ibn Mu'adh was answering, and this uh, treatise that he wrote on it was uh, misattributed in translation by Gerard of Cremona, you hear, and it was translated as a book called Al-Hazin's book on the crepuscules which Ibn Sabra rahmatullahi alayhi, has proven that it ain't, uh, it is not the work of, uh, uh, of Ibn al-Haytham, it is indeed the work of Ibn Mu'adh. But it was translated into Latin, and the reasoner, again, not all translation, you shouldn't believe anything you see in translation, reasoner put this treatise together 
with the works of the Thesaurus of al Hazen, And you see here, in the last chapter of it, this street is in here, the same diagram that was used by De La Porta in here, has now the legacy of Ibn Mu'adh being re-adopted as Ibn al-Haytham, falsely translated, <laughs> and then now comes back into the Latin of the De La Porta as the true method by which you can calculate the height of the atmosphere, which he actually did. And in fact, this treatise <laughs> went into the East, and it survives in the Arabic sources in the East, and it is a very stabilized Arabic tradition. But what should stick in our mind, the importance of a juridical question how does it become a mathematical question? And my the colleague who will talk right after me, he will tell you about a whole lot of these things. How it becomes a mathematical question, and then it becomes very useful for people like Della Porta, who happens to be a very close friend, by the way, of Marcus Jobley first, but also because this slide is taking time. Come on. If I go, okay, that's, maybe we got this one. Yeah, that's not a good one. Uh, the same friend of Della Porta is none other than the famous Galileo, by the way. That famous Galileo made a statement here on his earliest work on the mechanical motion in his uh, De Moto uh, Antiquara. In chapter 20 of it, he says, there is a dispute against Aristotle because Aristotle had made the point that if, the, if I throw a stone, it has to come to a stop before it reveals all motion to reverse its stop, it has to come to a moment of rest. This apparently was a debate that was going on because now we see right before Galileo himself, Leonardo Benedetti was also saying, all you need to actually look from an observer here for a planet rowing on a circle, the trajectory of this planet in here will oscillate, meaning the shadow of it, will oscillate up and down without actually a moment of rest. So he said there is an instance where we have a reversal of motion without a moment of rest. This is Benedetto saying this. Galileo adopts this, and here he says, he has a third argument as to why, he gives us first two arguments, then the third argument as to why there is no need for a moment of rest. And he says, my third argument can be drawn from a certain rectilinear motion, which Nicholas Copernicus in his De Revolutionibus compounds of the motion of two circles. Guess what? That is indeed the story that is in the Copernican story. These are the two circles that move this one and that one, and hence the point H oscillates up and down without a moment of rest. This is in the, uh, the, indeed in the text of Copernicus. But where does this come from? This comes from the text of Tusi. Remember Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, and actually, thanks to Salim al-Hassani, who paid the guy who did this animation, uh, animation for me here, it is this one that indeed Tusi had proven that this dread dot, you see it oscillating up and down, as the circles are continuously moving, there is no point of rest in this one. Hence, Galileo thinks this is a very useful thing to make as an argument against Aristotle, incorporates it in his own uh, uh, motto. Uh, so things are a little bit tricky, but that's how these people knew about it. To also show that this five minutes, how much do I pay you per minute? <laughs> <laughs> Even globe makers in the, in the Dutch land, <laughs> in Holland, look what they were doing. They will make a celestial globe, but look what they will do here. You see the cancer here? A saratan, <laughs> right next to it. You will see here... Uh, uh, what is this one? I can't see it now anymore. Uh, oh, a dhira here. Huh? And then he has here a nathra, and then a shu'ar al-shami, a shu'ar al ghumaysa Why would a Dutch globe maker add Arabic names onto his celestial globe to be able to sell? And on top of it, he is not only inserting into the globe the constellation name, he is inserting a nathra, which is a lunar, lunar mansion. Who in Dutchland, <laughs> or who in the 17th century, this guy was writing, uh, died in 1673, who would be more impressed because the globe has now Arabic inscriptions on it? If the image was not that this is the authenticity that's coming. Arabic was a signal of authenticity that comes into the Renaissance and people are accepting it as we see. Even people like uh, 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 Scaliger, who was editing a 
purely uh, Latin text of Manilius Astronomicum. Edited the Latin text, but he needed to write a commentary on it. Look what he does in his commentary. He decorates the commentary with the references to Hebrew first, because that's how he can read the Arabic really from that. And then all of this, as you go, he uses the Arabic material to explain the Latin text that was written in the second century when he is editing it in the 17th century. You see the gymnastics, what these people are doing, and this is how this material is all buried together. First, <coughs> we, and then finally, we come to those famous uh, Oxford uh, uh, astronomers, and I have time only for, for one of them. John Greaves happily, happily fell onto this text of uh, 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 Farghani, uh, which is Kitab Jawama Ilm al Nujum, an elementary text on astronomy. But it had, it had some use for this Oxford astronomer, John Gray, and we can look at the manuscript, it's still at the Bodleian. And look what he does in this. And the pages are filled with notes by John Greaves on it. This is 17th century Oxford professor of astronomy. So he's doing all of this through the Kitab al Jawami of Fargani. This one too, you can see it. And then you can see even sometimes he has Inter, interlinear translations trying to understand the very elementary expressions of Arabic. This is how lab, uh, laboring he was trying to do that. This is 17th century. This is Oxford. This is not people in the streets picking up star names and doing all of this stuff. That's what he was teaching his students at Oxford and authenticating it by texts like this. He did something which is even much, much more dramatic. In the note that he has it in here, he gives us longi the longitude of what is called regulus, which is the, the star that is on the heart of lion. Because it happens to be very close to the, to the ecliptic, measurements of longitudes of this star can actually give us a much better value for precession if you compare it with much, much earlier longitudes that we had. And that was his purpose. So he notices it here. He notices what it was in Theon's and then he notices that it has moved till this time, and now he finds it in Al-Farghani's text. I think this is the last one. And now we can say Alhamdulillah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much.